And we're starting off this list with Oumuamua, this interstellar object that graced our solar system in 2017, has left scientists and astronomers scratching their heads a little bit. It's sparked intense speculation and wild theories, one of which suggests that it could be of extraterrestrial origin. Uh, the mystery surrounding Oumuamua begins with its unusual characteristics. It's elongated shape, unexpected tumbling motion set it apart from any known natural object. Some scientists argued that its unusual properties could be explained by natural processes such as outgassing or collisions, while others entertain the possibility of a more extraordinary explanation. That Oumuamua could be a technological artifact crafted by an alien civilization, which is much more fun but also could be much more scary depending on what those aliens uh, are like, what their goals are. The idea that Oumuamua could be an alien space spacecraft stems from its peculiar behavior and its origin from another star system. Its trajectory and speed seem to defy the gravitational rules observed in our solar system, raising questions about its true nature. Number 9. The Dybbuk Box The origins of this object can be traced back to Jewish folklore, where a Dybbuk refers to a malevolent spirit or demon that possesses the living. The box gained notoriety after it was listed for sale on an online auction site in the early 2000s. According to its alleged history, the box was said to have been owned by a Holocaust survivor who had kept it sealed and hidden away. Legend has it that anyone who encounters the divot box or opens it will be subjected to a series of misfortunes, physical ailments, and unexplained occurrences. Tales of paranormal activities such as strange odors, objects, moving on their own and vivid nightmares have been associated with the box. Some individuals even claim to have experienced severe health issues and financial ruin after coming into contact with it. It's currently held in Zach Baggins Haunted Museum and if we know anything about those with the last name Baggins, they're good at keeping dark items in their possession. That's a Lord of the Rings reference for you. Number 8. The Surrey Ghost Car Incident On a cold evening on December 11th, 2002, police in Surrey, England responded to several calls about a car having lost control and swerving off the road, crashing in a ditch about 100 yards from an exit ramp. Police arrived on the scene and at first they didn't see anything until they spotted something. Obscured by overgrowth was indeed a crashed vehicle and a lifeless body lay nearby. Who they would later discover was that of Christopher Brian Chandler, who had been wanted for robbery. What makes this case so odd though? is that based on the state of the vehicle and the body of the driver, the accident was determined to be about five months old. Police even confirmed with the family of Christopher that he'd gone missing in July of that year, five months before. So what was it that people had reported seeing that night? And at number seven, we have the Bermuda Triangle. So while this isn't an object necessarily, it is an area of the Earth that has baffled scientists for decades. The Bermuda Triangle, a region in the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean, has long been shrouded in mystery and continues to puzzle scientists to this day. The area has gained notoriety for numerous unexplained disappearances of ships aircrafts, which has led to speculation about paranormal or extraterrestrial activities. What makes the Bermuda Triangle so perplexing is the absence of a definitive scientific explanation for the incidents that have occurred there. Scientists have proposed various theories to explain the disappearances, including magnetic anomalies, rogue waves, and methane gas seepage from the ocean floor. However, none of these explanations have been able to fully account for the high number of incidents or the mysterious circumstances surrounding them. Next up, we have the Woman from Lem. The Woman from Lem statue is an ancient artifact believed by some to be cursed, associated with a series of misfortunes and tragedies that have befallen those who have possessed or encountered it. The statue was discovered in 1878 on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus and is estimated to date back to around 3000 BCE. The figurine re represents a seated female figure with her hands on her stomach and is made of limestone. Legend has it that the curse of the one of Lem was unleashed when the statue was first removed from its original location. It's said that those who possess or handle the statue are plagued by a string of unfortunate events, accidents, 
financial ruin and even death, which has earned the statue the nickname Goddess of Death. Every owner of the statue lost their own life or several members of their family within a short time span after taking possession of this mysterious statue. The last owners died, leaving the statue to their two sons who finally put an end to the madness and passed the hot potato of death to a museum. Then the curator died. Number five, Robert the Doll, a creation of the German toy company Steiff, possesses an eerie and malevolent presence behind those beady little eyes. The story of Robert begins in 1904 in Key West, Florida, when he was gifted to a four-year-old Robert Eugene Otto. There are differing accounts of the doll's origins, with some suggesting it was a present from Jean's grandfather and others claiming that a disgruntled maid cursed the doll before giving it to him. The point is, it's rumored to be cursed. Whenever Jean's belongings were disrupted or damaged, he would blame the doll, claiming Robert did it. As Jean grew older, he became an artist, got married, and returned to his childhood home, which he renamed the Artist House. Very creative name there. Due to his wife's dislike of Robert, Jean relocated the doll to the attic. People passing by reported witnessing Robert change positions on his own and peering out the window at them. Visitors to the house claimed to hear footsteps and laughter emanating from the attic. After Jean's passing, Robert and the estate were inherited by Myrtle Reuter. She endured the peculiar occurrences for about two decades before eventually donating Robert to the Fort East Martello Museum. To this day, Robert remains there, believed to bring bad luck to those who disrespect him, which uh, and sometimes visitors will even write letters seeking forgiveness of any perceived transgressions against him. Next up we have the Iceman. In 1991, a group of hikers stumbled upon a well-preserved body protruding from a glacier in the Ottstal Alps, situated on the Austria-Italy border. The discovery turned out to be the remains of a middle-aged man who had met a violent end over 5,000 years prior, having been struck down by an arrow. He was dubbed Otzi the Iceman. Australian molecular archaeologist Thomas Loy closely studied Otzi and discovered traces of blood from multiple individuals on him and suggested he likely perished in a skirmish of some sort. Loy's connection to the Iceman was noted in his obituary upon his death from natural causes at the age of 63, but some believe that there was a, a curse associated with the mummy. In the year following his discovery, forensic pathologist Reiner Henn, who had moved the remains into a body bag, died in a car accident while en route to deliver a lecture on the Iceman. And shortly after, mountain climber Kurt Fritz, who had arranged the helicopter retrieval of Otzi perished in an avalanche. Reiner Holtz, who had filmed the retrieval, passed away from a brain tumor, and the years that followed, three more deaths occurred in connection with Otzi. Helmut Simon, one of the hikers who discovered Otzi, died after a fall, and archaeologist Conrad Spindler, one of the primary researchers, succumbed to complications from multiple sclerosis. Finally, in October of 2005, Thomas Loy became the last individual associated with the Iceman to pass away. The Bassano vase, or vase, depending on how you want to pronounce it. According to the tale, a silver vase crafted during the 15th century found its way into the possession of a bride on the eve of her wedding near Naples, Italy. But someone took her life at just at the most inconvenient time, which was that very night. She was found clutching the vase in her hands. The item was passed down through her family over the years, and the vase seemed to bring a dreadful fate to anyone who owned it, leading the family family to ultimately decide to hide it from the world. In 1988, though, the vase made an unexpected reappearance, accompanied by a foreboding note that ominously warned of its supposed curse. However, when the Bassano vase was up for auction and sold for approximately $2,250, the note's contents were conveniently omitted from the item description, and sadly, within a mere three months, the pharmacist who purchased the vase uh, died. After that, a series of tragic deaths happened with each new owner until a desperate family pleaded with the police to get rid of that thing and uh, it's never been seen since. I imagine the cops were must have been kind of aggravated responding to that call. They probably just dumped the thing in their garbage as they were walking out the person's house. And number two, a Polish vampire burials. Archaeologists have stumbled upon some rather bone chilling stuff in Poland. Vampire burials. These discoveries dating back to the 17th and 
and 18th centuries offer a peek into the beliefs and rituals surrounding vampires in old Polish folklore. So picture this, bodies laid to rest with their heads removed, positioned between their legs, or with sickles and scythes placed right across their necks just in case the corpse tried to climb out of its grave. And some unlucky souls even had stakes hammered through their hearts. Pretty brutal. These practices were all aimed at immobilizing the undead and keeping them from coming back and sinking their fangs into unsuspecting victims. And coming in at first place is Yellowstone Supervolcano. The Yellowstone Supervolcano, located within Yellowstone National Park in the United States, has captured the attention and concern of scientists due to its potential for catastrophic eruption. It is considered one of the largest and most active volcanic systems on Earth. While the last eruption occurred approximately 640,000 years ago, scientists are worried, at least some of them anyway, about the possibility of another eruption in the future. One of the primary reasons for concern is the volcanic activity observed at Yellowstone, like the frequent occurrence of earthquakes and, and ground uplift. These signs indicate ongoing magma movement beneath the surface suggesting that the volcano is still active and capable of eruption. The geological record reveals that Yellowstone has experienced three major eruptions in the last two million years, with an average reoccurrence interval of about 600,000 to 800,000 years. The potential consequences of a Yellowstone eruption are alarming. The eruption could release an enormous amount of volcanic ash and gases into the atmosphere, causing, of course, widespread destruction. I don't really know what the point is in revealing that kind of information to us. It's not like if we all know it's gonna somehow stop it from erupting, but anyway, it is what it is. Number 10, radioactive fish. Now, most of you will have seen the three-eyed fish from the Simpsons that lives in the pond near the reactor in Springfield. But what if I told you there were some real creepy creatures growing near a real nuclear site? The Chernobyl nuclear meltdown is the biggest disaster of its kind that has ever occurred, and the site and surrounding area still remains uninhabitable to this day, unless you're not a human, that is. In the cooling pond for the now destroyed reactor, some monsters lie in wait. Massive catfish, thought to be the result of radiation mutation. I mean, Look at that thing. The largest found at the site was measured to be 1.65 meters in length, and that's the size of a person. I would assume that that was a mutant too, especially given how close it is to the defunct reactor. But scientists have discovered that the absolutely gargantuan fish have not been affected by radiation, but by the rest of the cooling pond's ecosystem. Since there are no predators for the catfish that still live in the pond, they have an isolated food chain that they can be the king of, feeding on smaller fish, worms, and even amphibians allowing them to grow to this massive size. Scientists are still doing more research in the area to see how other wildlife has been affected by the radiation. Number nine, bobbing for brains. In 2017, British Columbia's Stanley Park hosted what they called a Bio Blitz, a 24-hour event where scientists and adventurers of all ages would come together to try to catalog as many species in the area as they could. One of the so-called blitzers saw something strange in the water, a pulsating slimy blob, and when they went in for a closer look, it seemed that they'd stumbled across a human brain floating there in the pond. Upon further inspection, however, it was revealed that it was in fact a rare colony of microorganisms that had grouped together, known as a bryozoan. These organisms, which feed on algae and plankton, group together in large blobs, so they can stand a better chance against the harsh world of an aquatic ecosystem. But they were thought to not exist in freshwater west of the Mississippi River, which was both exciting and concerning to scientists. Since they can only survive in waters that are warmer than 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 and a half degrees Celsius, scientists think that this can be another warning sign of global warming showing rising water temperatures around the world and the effect that it has on the ecosystem. Number eight, coffin on the course. In 2019, maintenance workers at the Tetney Golf Club in Grimsby, England, were tending to a water hazard, and they stumbled upon something amazing under a mound of gravel at the bottom of the pond, a large wooden coffin. When archeologists arrived to investigate, they realized the significance this find could hold. So, to keep the wood from disintegrating when it was removed from the water, they put it in a bag while it was underwater so that it could be removed from the pond while staying submerged. After sitting in cold storage for a year to strengthen it for examination, scientists began their work and opened the coffin. Inside, they found no identifiable remains as DNA testing has proved unfruitful. Likely, they rotted away under the water, but they did find something else 
an axe, which appears to be from the Bronze Ages, around 40,000 years ago. Woolly mammoths still roamed the earth at that time. The coffin was made from a single oak tree and was lined with plants for cushioning, which helped date the objects. It also shows that whoever was buried in it was of some great esteem. For number seven, we take an even darker turn. In 2017, Oklahoma resident Brandon Duran had his life taken by his ex-wife and her new boyfriend, but his body was not discovered for quite some time. That is, until a witness who actually helped dispose of the deceased came forward and told the police where he could be found. Police sent divers to the bottom of a local pond, and what they found was truly shocking. Multiple buckets were retrieved from the bottom of the pond, and forensic research showed that after he had died, perpetrators decided to dispose of him in the grisly manner of dismembering, then placing body parts in different buckets, filling them with concrete, and throwing them into the pond. The people who committed this gruesome crime were arrested and brought to justice, and a documentary was even made about the case. Number six, boiling point. Now, We've all heard of hot springs, but this next entry really takes the cake. This interesting body of water is located on the beautiful island of Dominica, and has some very strange properties. It was first reported in 1870, but it wasn't until 1875 that it was fully investigated by scientists. The 250 foot wide lake was giving off steam, and even bubbling, and the temperatures measured were around 92 degrees Celsius at the water's edge, near boiling. And the water was too hot to measure in the center, but since the water is actively bubbling, it must be over 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit. The water is likely heated by an underwater volcano, which causes gas heated by magma to increase the temperature of the water to its boiling point. Scientists have seen periodic large fluctuations in both the temperature and the water level, which they attribute to eruptions nearby. In 1880, the lake disappeared almost completely and became a fountain of hot water and steam, or a geyser, refilling over the next few years. In 2004, the the levels lowered by 33 feet, but in 2005 refilled completely in one day. This showed scientists just how fragile the local geological systems are, even though it seems like the next level of a hot spring do not go swimming here. Number five, frozen flames. Speaking of hot water, this next entry on the list has shocked scientists around the world because even though this pond in Alaska is frozen over, the water can actually be lit on fire. These special bodies of water are called thermokarsts, and when frozen over, flammable gas coming from the bottom is trapped and then released when a hole is stabbed in the surface, allowing for the impressive display of fire and ice when lit. But it wouldn't be on this list if there wasn't something more sinister behind it. The reason this phenomenon is occurring is what frightening, because the gas being released is methane gas, which is not only very flammable, but a potent greenhouse gas. So why are more and more of these methane lakes being found? Well, most of this gas was actually frozen and trapped in soil and ice during the Ice Age, and now, rising global temperatures as a result of climate change are melting these methane beds, creating huge pockets of greenhouse gases just waiting to be released into the atmosphere. So while this is a cool party trick, the fact that it can happen at all proves that we need to find a way to combat both the cause and the effects. Number four, cannibal frogs. The name Goliath frog is crazy enough on its own, but there's more to these amazing African amphibians than their size. While the frogs themselves can weigh as much as a whopping 3.3 kilograms, or 7.2 pounds, they're strong enough to move stones up to two thirds of their own size. They move these rocks to create nests for their young to be protected from predators and the environment. The stones and other objects used create their own pond and and the frog then lays their eggs inside. And as the tadpoles hatch and grow, they leave the nest on their own once they're big enough to scale the walls. Unfortunately, most of these tadpoles will never make it out alive. Many species of frogs, including the Goliath frog, eat not only insects and other arthropods, but they also eat their own tadpoles and even other frogs. So not only are these guys massive, but they're cannibals too. Giant cannibal frogs. Now. That sounds like a movie on par with Sharknado. Number three, ancient tools and bones. In 2018, archeologists were working in the Nifud Desert in Saudi Arabia and came across something they were not expecting. I know, I know, a desert is not a pond, but this desert was once the bed of a pond or swampy area, shown by fossilized bones that have been found of small water birds, grazing animals, and even predators that frequented watering holes like jaguars. But along with the bones, the scientists also uncovered stone tools made by humans between 
between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago, proving that earlier fossils they had found with chips and cuts were caused by humans. The tools were most likely made and used by early hominins like Homo erectus and predate any other artifacts found in the Arabian Peninsula by more than 100,000 years. Things like this showing just how long humans have been around and how far we've come always blows my mind. Number two, haunted by horses. In Milton, Ontario, there's a disturbing legend that dates all the way back to 1885 at Crawford Lake, one of the many bodies of fresh water in Ontario. The story goes that a father and son were carting lumber across the frozen lake in the winter for construction or for warmth, nobody knows. But their horse-drawn cart was too heavy when weighed down with the cargo and crashed through the ice. The father and son floated to the surface and escaped with their lives, but the horses attached to the cart were sadly dragged to the bottom, where they sit perfectly preserved. At night, from the water's edge, they can be seen staring out from the depths with ghostly red eyes, longing to escape their watery grave. No one has officially investigated this, so for now, the mystery remains unsolved. Number one, Death Pond. If you're not already afraid of the ocean, this should do the trick. One and a half miles under the surface of the Indian Ocean lies a so-called Death Pond, created from pockets of minerals over 23 million years ago, and it kills anything that enters it instantly. Fish, shrimp, eels, you name it. If it enters, it never leaves. Scientists have discovered many of these death ponds throughout the Red Sea, and they're filled with brine and salty solutions, but absolutely zero oxygen, which is what makes the area so deadly to sea creatures. Other predators use these pools as hunting grounds, cleaning up the borders of anything that made the mistake of trying to swim through, as they go into shock from the lack of oxygen and immediately die, making for easy pickings for the predators. You know what they say, work smarter, not harder. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the hero ant. This is a type of ant that was officially classified in 2014. These ants nest in the ground or in rotten wood and they were found in Madagascar. The name of these ants comes from this wild technique they have when it comes to an intruder who is invading their territory. Of course, these ants feel a duty to protect their home and their colony, so what do they do when someone threatens their safety? Well, they grab a hold of the intruder and throw them and themselves off of the ant equivalent of a cliff. So far, it seems like they are the only species that willingly throws themselves off of cliffs, but hey, it earned them the name of a hero, so maybe it was all worth it. Somehow these ants are able to pick themselves up after the fall and get right back to work. In our number nine spot today, we have Salazar's Pit Viper. This new green pit viper species was discovered in 2019 and finally classified in 2020. It was first found in the Himalayas and was actually one of five new reptile species found in the area that year. If you're a Harry Potter lover, this one might be obvious, but the snake was named after the Harry Potter character Salazar Slytherin. The snake features a dark green head and yellowish green dorsal scales throughout the rest of its body. The males and females of this species have different physical characteristics, with the males having yellow orange and reddish orange stripes with a rust colored tail, which is something that is not seen on the females. The snakes are nocturnal and are often found coiled around shrubs at night. Currently their habitat is under threat due to developments such as road widening, agriculture and hydroelectric projects. Not to mention the current plans to build a 49 kilometer long road that cuts directly through their habitat. In our number 8 spot today we have the Emperor Dumbo Octopus. These guys are a new species of Dumbo Octopus that was discovered just last year. It was discovered in the Emperor Seamounts in the North Pacific Ocean just off of the coast of Japan. The location of the discovery is where they got their name from, which I thought was important to include because when I first heard their name, I thought it meant that they were huge, which was initially a little concerning. There is actually only one of these species that has ever been found, which was the single specimen that was used to confirm this discovery. Because the specimen was found alive and was the only one we've located, scientists were thankfully careful to use only non-invasive techniques to identify it, which include micro CT scans and 3D imaging. These techniques ensure that the little guy could continue living his life while we can also learn more about it, which truly is the best of both worlds. The one we found was located at a depth of around 3,900 to 4,400 meters in the ocean. In our number seven spot today, we have the deadly sponge. To be perfectly honest, sea sponges have always kind of creeped me out. 
Like they're just so different and it's crazy that they really are alive. But this newly discovered species of sea sponges takes things to a whole new level. These sponges, to something like a shrimp, would probably look like a lovely place to take a little rest stop. But upon closer examination, they're hiding a deadly little secret. While most sea sponges filter water that they flush through their bodies and get nutrients from all of these single celled organisms that pass through, these species of sea sponges, announced in 2014, have decided that they need a little something more. That's right, these sea sponges are carnivores. These sponges feature these tiny little microscopic hooks on them that act like Velcro for that unsuspecting shrimp. Once snagged by the sponge, after a few hours, the sponge's cells will start to engulf and digest it, and within a few days, all that will be left is an empty shell. Definitely one of those circle of life things, but still, it's a little macabre to be perfectly honest. In our number six spot today, we have the pine. Rockland trapdoor spider. Maybe not terrifying to scientists, but definitely terrifying to me. This spider has a bit of an interesting discovery story. This spider species was actually discovered in 2012, but it wasn't really researched and found out to be a new spider species until last year in 2021. When this spider was originally found, it was located by a staff member at the Miami Zoo who was inspecting reptile research traps. When this staff member was unable to identify this spider, Spider based on the existing records of spiders in the area, they knew that they had found something unusual. Two years later, another one of these spiders was found and looked at by experts in the field. Rebecca Godwin, who is a PhD, who is the assistant professor of biology at Piedmont College in Demorest, Georgia, was able to confirm that this spider was in fact a previously undescribed species. After years of research, she was able to officially identify it as a new species similar to a tarantula. This discovery was extremely exciting as it came from an endangered piece of forest that is located in the middle of a city. Researchers have explained that this is just one of the many reasons why it is so important that we work to preserve these kinds of areas so that we don't lose the things we do know, but also those that we don't yet. In our number five spot today, we have the deepwater snapper. This new fish belongs to a small genus of bottom dwelling fish that are absolutely massive. There were previously three different species belonging to the genus, but this one marks the fourth. The newer discovered one is seemingly identical to one of the other already discovered species with the same bright pink color, the same usual ocean depth of around 200 to 400 meters, and they're also both usually found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. But despite all of this, the genetics of these fish are actually different. The new species also has a few small physical details that set it apart from the others, such as smaller eyes and a black spot on the tip of its upper tail fin. It is believed that this fish had previously been misidentified as the other similar species, and since these fish are usually caught on the same fishing line, this new distinction is incredibly important for fisheries because each fish species needs to be managed differently. The fish was named in honor of Dr. Brian Bowen, who is a researcher at the University of Hawaii, who has spent over three decades of his life dedicated to studying marine fish. In our number four spot today, we have the false gecko. This is definitely among the smallest of the creatures on this list. List, measuring at just 42 to 52 millimeters long. These little guys were found on the southeastern tip of the main island of the Philippines, Luzon. Their scientific name comes from their tendency to hide in hollow areas such as logs. They have inverted Y-shaped markings along their entire tail, as well as golden yellow colored eyes, which apparently are reflective. Previous to the discovery of this new false gecko, there were nine other known species of false geckos, all of which are endemic to to the Philippines. Because of their small size, their tendencies to hide, and their camouflage abilities, these little guys are extremely difficult to find, which is definitely part of the reason they are such a new discovery. One of the researchers on the team of scientists who discovered this new species explained that this new discovery just might create a greater appreciation for the biodiversity in the Philippines and will hopefully prompt a better management of the wilderness areas located there. Researchers are currently worried that this brand new species might be close to extinction due to habitat loss. In our number three spot today, we have marsupial frogs. These guys were discovered in 2021 and they were found in a protected part of the Amazon rainforest. It is estimated that there is the highest concentration of undiscovered animals in the Amazon, so it really makes sense that we would find a new species here. These frogs feature a green color and they have a coarse granular and patternless dorsal skin. They have
have turquoise colored eyes and their venter doesn't have any sort of splotches, specks or dots. I'm not gonna lie, I had to look up what a venter is, but I guess it's just like the belly area of the frog. You know, the more you know. These guys are called marsupial frogs because the females hold eggs in a closed dorsal pouch, which is similar to that of like a kangaroo or other kinds of marsupial animals. In our number two spot today, we have the enigma moth. This is a type of moth that was discovered back in 2015, and it is regarded as quite an exciting discovery, to be quite honest. While I personally hate moths, this one even has me feeling all right about it. On Kangaroo Island, which is in South Australia, it was discovered that the island, which has been settled since 1836, was holding an insect species that was entirely unknown to science. When these moths were found, they were realized to have more primitive features, so scientists had a job to figure out just how primitive. Turns out these guys are kind of like a living fossil. Even the most primitive moths we know of have jaws. A sign of a more recent moth is that of a tongue. But this newly discovered moth species has neither a tongue nor a jaw. All in all, this discovery is said to have been one of the most exciting in entomology in the last 40 years. One of the reasons these moths might have been hard to pin down is because their adult lives are lived in one single day. And one day they emerge from their cocoon, mate, reproduce, and then die. Definitely a jam-packed day, that's for sure. In our number one spot today, we have the Bone House Wasp. Well, really all you need to know about this one is in its name. These wasps were discovered in southeast China in 2014, and their scientific name was inspired by graveyard bone houses or ossuaries. This is because the females of this species, after they lay eggs, will riddle their home with dead ant corpses. Yeah, not exactly the same sort of nesting I was expecting, but hey, to each their own. Own. Of course, this is thought to potentially make their nest less vulnerable to predators, and the smell of the dead ants might even fully deter them and completely camouflage the nest. All in all, while it is of course a survival tactic, it's also quite a gruesome thought. Coming in at number 10 is 2,000 year old civilization discovered. A team of researchers affiliated with multiple institutions in the US, working with a colleague from France and another in Guatemala, has discovered a very large 2,000 year old Mayan civilization in northern Guatemala. This group describes using LIDAR to conduct a survey of the area. LIDAR is a detection system similar to radar, but is based on laser light rather than radio waves. In recent years, it's been used to scan parts of dense tropical rainforests for signs of ancient civilizations. In this new effort, researchers flew over parts of Guatemala as part of a mapping effort when they came across what they described as a vast ancient Maya civilization. In studying their maps, they were able to see that the ancient Ancient civilization was made up of more than 1,000 settlements covering approximately 650 square miles, most of which were linked by multiple causeways. The researchers were also able to see that the people who once lived in the settlements had been densely packed, a finding that goes against the theory suggesting early Mesoamerican settlements tended to be sparsely populated. The researchers also found evidence of large platforms and pyramids in some settlements, which they note suggests them served as centralized hubs for work, recreation, and politics. So that's just pretty cool. Number nine, sacrifices. Now the Mayans didn't just sacrifice animals, oh no, they sacrificed humans too. During the pre-Columbian era, human sacrifice in Maya culture was a ritual of offering nourishment to the gods and goddesses. Blood was viewed as a potent source of nourishment for the Maya deities, and the sacrifice of a living creature was a powerful blood offering. By extension, the sacrifice of a human life was the ultimate offering of blood to the gods, and the most important Maya ritual culminated in human sacrifice. Human sacrifice is depicted in classic Maya art, is mentioned in classic period glyph texts, and has been verified by analysis of skeletal remains from the classic and post-classic AD 900 period. Additionally, human sacrifice is described in a number of late Maya and early Spanish colonial texts. The sacrifice of an enemy king was the most prized offering, with such a sacrifice involved in the decapitation of the captive ruler in the ritual reenactment of the decapitation of the Maya maze god by the Maya death gods. Heart extractions and sacrifice have been viewed as a supreme
religious expression among the ancient Maya. The removal of the still beating heart was considered a great offering and meal for the gods. Like any modern religious ritual, it is believed the extraction had multiple steps for preparation and proper respect for the gods. Number 8. Monkey Shaped Skull So the Maya played a fun but somewhat deadly sport that involved two opposing teams passing a ball using only their knees, hips, and elbows. What made this sport deadly was that the losing team could be sacrificed at the end of the game. To protect themselves from injury and to make certain maneuvers easier, the players wore different types of clothing, including a handguard worn around the wrist. Now archaeologists have discovered a monkey shaped skull, which they concluded was a representation of this particular hand guard. The Maya believed that they would still play their ball game even after they died. To prepare them for the afterlife sport, they created stone versions of the different types of clothing that they'd wear during the real life games. These stone versions, like the monkey shaped skull, were commonly found inside of tombs, and it seemed like it was like Squid Game in real life. Number 7. Maya City at Mexico Construction Site Archaeologists have uncovered the ruins of an ancient Maya city filled with palaces, pyramids, and plazas on a construction site of what will become an industrial park near Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. We think more than 4,000 people lived around here, said Carlos Perza, one of the archaeologists who led the excavation of the city, which is estimated to have been occupied from 600 to 900 AD. There were people from different social classes, priests, scribes who lived in these great places, and there were also common people who lived in small buildings, Carlos said. Researchers also located nearby burial grounds of adults and young who were interred with obiacin and flint tools, offerings, and other belongings. Number 6. Discovery of Super Highways In the newly found 2,000 year old Mayan civilization in the northeastern Guatemala, researchers have discovered the Mayans used super highways, a 110 mile network of raised stone trails or causeways that link the communities revealed that early civilization was home to an even more complex society than previously thought, according to a recent analysis on the architecture groupings. They're the world's first super highway system that we have, said lead study author Richard Hansen, a professor professor of anthropology at Idaho State University. What's amazing about the causeways is they all unite these cities together like a spider web, which forms one of the earliest and first state societies in the western hemisphere. The causeways, which rised above the seasonal swamps and dense forest flora of the Maya lowlands, formed a web of implied social, political, and economic interactions with further implications regarding strategies of governance due to how difficult they would have been to build, according to the study. Number 5. Elite Residences Researchers in Mexico have uncovered a new group of structures at Chichen Itza, the famed Maya archaeological site, that may have once belonged to the city's elite. The new find comes from the work of Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History. Prior to this discovery, experts didn't know of any residential structures at this location. The housing complex could represent the first residential group where a ruler lived with his entire family, Francisco Pires Ruins, an archaeologist with Inna said. The recently discovered complex includes an entrance arch as well as the House of Snails, the House of Moon, and the so-called Palace of Phalluses. Jose Orsoro Leon, another archaeologist from Inna, says the existence of an elite housing structure indicates that others like it may be waiting to be discovered. There must be more residential groups that have not been explored yet. He added the study of the peripheral groups around the Central Park could tell us about their family, the other groups that made up this great city. Number 4. Beauty Standards To be beautiful Beautiful in Mayan culture was the result of incredibly hard work. They had a set of seemingly impossible beauty standards, some of which required serious body modification. One such practice was flattening the forehead entirely. The Mayans skirted evolution and bounds of human anatomy by literally clamping a plank of wood to a young person's face. As a result, they were able to control the growth of a person's head. Now, it didn't stop at foreheads though. Mayans also believed that cross eyes were a sign of favor from their sun god, Kanicha who was also cross-eyed. And of course, being well liked by the god of the sun is a pretty valuable thing. So as a result, some of the young spent days at a time with objects dangled between their eyes in the hopes it would artificially cross their eyes forever. Then there's the teeth. Aside from encrusting their teeth with gems, many also sharpened them to a point. And sometimes teeth were filed to specific designs to designate higher classes of individuals. 
Number three, ceremonial complex. An enormous 3,000 year old earth platform topped with a series of structures, including a 13 foot high pyramid, has been identified as the oldest and largest monumental construction discovered in the Maya region. It's the latest discovery to support the emerging view that some of the earliest structures built in the Maya region were significantly larger than those built more than a millennium later during the classic Maya period 250 to 900 AD when the empire was at its peak. The discovery took place in Mexico's tobacco state at the site of Aguada Phoenix. It's region region is known as the Maya Lowlands, from which the Maya civilization began to emerge. The initial construction of the platform is believed to begin around 1000 BC, based on radiocarbon dating of charcoal inside the complex, said archaeologist Takashi Emoda. He added, we think this was a ceremonial center, it's a place of gathering, possibly involving processions and other rituals we can only imagine. No residential buildings have been found on or around the structure, so it's unclear how many people may have lived by, but the large size of the platform leads him to think the builders of this place were gradually leaving their hunter-gathering lifestyle behind, likely aided by the cultivation of corn evidence which also has been found at the site. Number 2. The Cave Sacuinum is a cenote located in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It's a place that locals feared and in 2012 a team of divers discovered the reason behind its fearsome reputation. An underwater survey discovered two chambers of the cenote littered with human bones, including deformed skulls. The top of the craniums were intentionally flattened during infancy. This method of deformation was widely practiced by the ancient Maya and is consistent with skulls that have been found in the customary burials from the same period. A team found a total of 15 skulls. Goals, and why does this cenote hold the remains of so many people who appear to be males, females, teenagers, and adults? Most residents were buried under or near their houses, so this wasn't a normal cemetery. The bones bear no marks that would indicate cause of death, so the people probably weren't sacrificed. The researcher wonders whether the location is a clue. Sequayam lies under south of Maya Pen's direction that the Maya associated with the underworld, humankind's mythical place of origin, known as Shibalba. The dead might have been buried here to await the next cycle of creation. Also, the builders of the city wall seem to have deliberately excluded the cenote from the city. They could have been plague victims as you wouldn't want them near the rest of the population and you wouldn't want to drink that water either. Now the evidence fits these theories, but it seems like we'll never know. And coming in at number one is climate change. New research has come to light that indicates climate change may have played a significant role in the collapse of the Mayans. A new ultra detailed climate record from a cave in Belize reveals classic Mayan civilization collapsed over centuries as rain dried up, disrupting agriculture and causing instability that led to wars and the crumbling of large cities. A final major drought after the political collapse of the Maya may be what kept the civilization from bouncing back. Researchers have used geological records of climate from lake sediments to undercover evidence of drought, but the new study uses a cave formation to trace a 2,000 year history of rainfall in more detail than ever. Researchers removed a stalgmite from the ground of the caves in a layer that sits close to a number of classic Maya settlements. This stalgmite had been growing slowly but continuously from 40 BC to AD 2006, and by analyzing it, researchers were able to pin down rainfall levels twice a year for 2,000 years. They found that during early periods of classic Maya civilization, Civilization, this region in the world was abnormally wet. And sure enough, wet periods in the climate record coincided with the eras of expansion, building, and stone monument construction, according to the archaeological record. After about AD 660, however, things began to change. The overall climate started to get drier, with more frequent short term droughts. By between 820 and 870, the Maya were struggling to get by on 40% less of rainfall than before the drying period. Does this sound familiar to you? Because it sure does to me. Will we end up like the Mayans? Starting us off at number 10 is the monster study. In 1939, speech pathologists at the University of Iowa set out to prove their theory that stuttering was a learned behavior that was caused by a child's anxiety towards speaking aloud. So how did they go about testing this theory? Well, for starters, all the subjects were orphans, and they told these impressionable minds that they were going to be receiving speech therapy. From there, they split the 22 orphans down the middle, providing half of the subjects with 
with positive reinforcement and praise of their speech fluency, while the other half was belittled for making any kind of speech imperfections. Essentially, the negative half was told that they were doomed to start stuttering once they began to speak, and then told that they were stuttering even if they weren't. So just straight up mind games. Once the seed was planted, they would sit down with the orphans and insist they did not speak unless they would be able to speak right, meaning without a stutter, despite the fact that most of them never stuttered to begin with. Eventually, the orphans began shutting down, some refusing to speak entirely, all based on a false accusation. The entire experiment caused an insane amount of psychological harm to the students, and some even developed speech impediments through the sheer gaslighting of being told they had one. Coming in at number 9 is the Milgram Experiment. Named after the psychologist Stanley Milgram, who spearheaded the experiment, this study began in the summer of 1961 and looked at testing the limits of obedience. Many academics at the time wanted to take a look into what was at the core of an authoritative personality, and how someone could be swayed to commit something that they didn't want to do simply because they believed they had to. Once the study began, two groups were made. One group was assigned to be actors, and the other group was tasked with shocking the person in the room after they answered a question wrong. What group two didn't know was that group one was not actually being shocked, just acting as if they were. As it turns out, an incredibly high proportion of the subjects continued to shock the group despite thinking they were hurting them, simply because they felt they had no other choice. But later, another scientist thought the experiment needed to be amped up as he hypothesized people could have felt the victims were faking it. This new study included real life dogs as the subjects being shocked, and test subjects apparently openly wept while still following orders to shock the dogs. I mean, first of all, why bring the sweet puppies into this? And secondly, the psychological harm that was caused by these people feeling forced to harm others is just evil. Coming in at number 8 is Kurt Blome. One of the many evil scientists during World War II was Kurt Blome. And just like the rest of them, he too performed indescribable acts on the prisoners in hopes to further scientific understanding. Or at least, that's what was being said at the time. His main choice of torture was purposefully injecting the prisoners with cancer and typhus. But not because they were looking on how to cure it, no, they literally were looking on how to best cause it. The reason behind that was that Blome was in charge of all biological warfare in the SS, and so his experiments aimed to find the best way to use these diseases against their enemies, debilitating them. I mean, bio-warfare as a whole is an insane concept. Like, just imagine researching how to best infect your enemies with an incurable disease in order to win a war. It's so wild to me. But what is truly mind-blowing about the whole situation is that despite being arrested and put on the doctor's trial for his his evil doings in 1947, and admitting to what he had done, the US intervened in his prosecution for wartime atrocities and got him off the hook. From there, the US Army Chemical Corps hired him to work on biological warfare projects in their country. So not only did he get away with his evil experiments, he continued on with them for another country's benefit. Coming in at number 7 is J. Marion Sims. Widely regarded as the father of modern gynecology, Dr. Sims gained most of his fame from doing experimental surgeries on slave women in the mid 1800s. He's quite a controversial character in medical history for several reasons, because while he did provide advancements like the invention of the speculum and developed new surgical techniques for dealing with the female anatomy, he also performed on unconsenting slaves without anesthesia. And not to mention, the reason he didn't use anesthesia was not because it wasn't available to him, it was because he believed that the operation were, quote, not painful enough to justify the trouble. Further, there were several of his patients who suffered extreme complications. One woman almost died from sepsis after a sponge was left inside her, and another woman was performed on a total of 30 times. Many in the medical community have condemned his work as they feel he was manipulating the social institution of slavery to perform human experimentation, and that despite what he may have discovered, countless women were tortured in order to do so. Coming in at number 6 is Karl Klauberg. Another horrible scientist during World War II, back in 1942, Klauberg approached Henrik Heimler, who was a major figure in the German party at the time, and asked if he could receive a large number of women for 
research purposes. From there, his proposal was accepted, so off to the cruel camp he went. Once he was there, the so-called research began. I mean, truthfully, it was really more human torture under the guise of science. I'm sure you're wondering just what was Klauberg experimenting? Well, he wanted to figure out how to sterilize women in the most cost-efficient way, so he would inject formaldehyde directly into their stomachs without any painkillers. He experimented on thousands of prisoners, but only 700 survived, although all were left sterile. Now, as I'm sure you can put together, the reason behind this forced sterilization had to do with eugenics, but on top of putting formaldehyde in the victims, he also mentally tortured his patients too. In order to make sure that the experiment had worked, he needed to inseminate them to make sure that they wouldn't conceive. But for an extra layer of cruelty, he would tell his patients that he injected them with animal sperm to try and create a monster. Coming in at number five, the Tuskegee study. Back in 1932, the United States Public Health Service began to dive into the natural progression of syphilis if left untreated. And while that is very valuable knowledge to know about in order to prevent complications in the future, there are definitely better ways to go about it. In this study, 600 poor and illiterate men, of which only 399 previously had syphilis, were hired and none were told about what the experiment was going to be for, or that they had a life-threatening disease to begin with. The 600 men were instead told that they were actually receiving free healthcare, meals, and burial insurance in exchange for participating. What's even more sick is that even though penicillin was proven to be an effective cure in 1947, the study continued all the way until 1972, essentially needlessly infecting hundreds of people and watching them die of a disease that already had a cure. It's just insane that this went on for so long, and it definitely is one of the most evil experiments to have seen the light of day. Coming in at number four is the Stanford Prison Experiment. Probably one of the most notorious experiments ever recorded is the 1971 Stanford Experiment. In 1971, Philip Zambardo set out to test the nature of human nature, specifically what happens when you put good people in evil situations. To do so, he set up a two-week study and paid college students $15 a day to play guards and prisoners. The day prior to the official start, those assigned as guards were given an orientation and provided uniforms. The next day, those assigned as prisoners were mock arrested by the police, a detail that utterly blindsided participants, and taken to the jail for the study to begin. Immediately upon arrival, they were dehumanized, forced into a strip search, given an ID number, and sent to their cells. Nearly immediately, things got out of hand. By day two, guards were harassing the inmates with psychological and physical abuse and prisoners were attempting to rebel against their treatment, which only exacerbated the abuse, prompting the guards to strip the prisoners of their uniforms, take their mattresses, and force them to relieve themselves in buckets. On the third day, alliances were being formed, offering rewards to prisoners with good behavior, and by the fourth day, full-on riots were breaking out. Things escalated so badly that the experiment ended on the sixth day, a whole week before it was scheduled to end. While incredibly controversial, the Stanford Prison Experiment has been the basis of psychologists and even historians' understanding of how even healthy people can become evil when placed in certain situations. Next up at number three is the Willowbrook Experiments. In the 1950s, one institution ran a very, very dark experiment that I honestly can't quite believe was able to happen even then. The institution was for young disabled people, specifically those deemed to have a mental illness or a mental disorder at the time, and due to highly unsanitary conditions in the institution, many contracted hepatitis. You would think this would maybe make them go, hmm, maybe we should tidy up around here, protect those that are under our care. But that was not quite their approach. Instead, Dr. Sal Krugman proposed an experiment to try and develop a vaccine. Now, while I can appreciate the thought that was behind his proposition, rather than testing on the already contracted citizens, they actually began purposefully infecting people with the disease to assist in the experiment. Now, don't get it twisted, there were many folks against this from the start, but ultimately parents of the admitted people gave their permission to affect them and use them in the study, so forth they went. Kind of crazy to believe that someone would 
actually go along with that, but apparently they didn't seem to care too much about infecting disabled people with a deadly disease. So. There you have it. Coming in at number two is Dr. Sigmund Rascher. As we have covered by this point, there were many, many evil scientists researching cruel experiments during World War II. And one of the worst doctors of the time was Dr. Sigmund Rascher. When he joined the army, he asked the leader if human subjects could be provided at his disposal. And by 1942, his wishes were granted. He began conducting experiments in pressure chambers where he would simulate a high altitude and then quickly alter the pressure to simulate the conditions of a pilot free falling with no oxygen. But he was most well known for his cruel freezing experiments on 300 prisoners, supposedly to figure out the best way to warm up soldiers who experienced hypothermia. He would either force his victims to remain outdoors completely naked in freezing temperatures for up to 14 hours, or would place them in tanks of ice for 3 hours, measuring their pulse and internal temperatures all the while. From there, they would warm up their victims, experimenting with a variety of different temperatures, including boiling water, often causing further harm. Along with his other forms of torture, Sigmund would also administer polygal, a substance to aid in blood clotting, and then shoot or amputate a limb on his victim to see the speed at which they would bleed out. I mean, you have to wonder what happens to someone in their life to make them this cruel and evil. And last up today in our number one spot is Shiro Ishii and Yuna. 731. During the 30s and 40s, notorious microbiologist and surgeon Shiro Ishii led the development and application of biological warfare for the infamous Unit 731. Shiro had long awaited to develop biological warfare, something that was against the Geneva Convention at the time, so in 1936, when he was promoted to senior army surgeon and granted full control over Unit 731, Shiro Ishii unleashed all evil. With no one to tell him no, Ishii began his evil experiments on live humans as he believed he could not get the results he was looking for by testing on animals. Ishii was notorious for injecting his subjects with deadly diseases under the guise of vaccines so that he could watch and study the effects if left untreated, leaving his victims suffering horrifying symptoms and eventually letting them die. But. That was only the tip of the iceberg. Victims of his evil experiments would also have limbs amputated and reattached to other parts of their bodies while conscious and without the use of any anesthesia, or be put into pressure chambers until their eyes literally escaped their skull. It's estimated that nearly 10,000 people died at the hands of Shiro Ishii's cruel experiments. But perhaps most insane of all is that after the war ended, he was never charged with any war crimes, as he traded the information obtained from his experiments for immunity and lived out the remainder of his life in Japan a free man. Starting us off at number 10 is an underwater graveyard. For thousands of years, the island of Madagascar was filled with all all kinds of interesting and strange species that couldn't be found anywhere else on the globe. But roughly 2,000 years back, when mankind discovered the island, the carefully balanced ecosystem filled with giant tortoises and elephant birds started deteriorating. While we don't know for sure what exactly caused the seismic shift in Madagascar's ecosystem, paleontologists exploring an underwater cave back in 2014 happened to come across some incredible, if not terrifying, fossilized remains from some of the out of this world creatures that are now long extinct. The most shocking being what was left of a giant gorilla sized lemur. But what they have not been able to figure out is how the lemur bones got into the underwater cave in the first place, considering it submerged under 82 feet of water and all. According to National Geographic, there's some belief that the giant bones could have been carried there by the current, or perhaps the area is newly or relatively newly underwater. Truth be told, we have no clue. I'm just grateful I can't be chased down by a 400 pound lemur if I ever decide to venture out to Madagascar. Next up at number 9 is a UFO. Ok listen, it wouldn't be a complete top 10 list without a little bit of conspiracy theory now would it? Back in 2014, a UFO enthusiast claimed to have spotted an alien spaceship inside one of the many ancient icy caves of Antarctica. According to the photo, about half of what looks identical to the quintessential essential flying saucer can be seen sticking out from the cave mouth and many believers theorize
surprised that the craft crash landed into the ice and got stuck. Other not so alien inclined have speculated that it could be linked to German World War II top secret war technology, but truth be told, neither of these theories have any facts to back them up. Well, there is a part of me that would kind of love it if the strange grey saucer in the photo really was a crash landed alien spacecraft. At this point in time, there is just not enough information to back up the claim, and scientists are not buying it. That being said, no one has really come forward with a different theory yet, so I mean, who knows, right? Next up at number 8 is a Mayan labyrinth. You know the maze from The Shining? Well, if you thought that one was scary, then just be glad you didn't live in the Mayan times. Back in 2008, researchers uncovered a mind boggling underground labyrinth built from stone pyramids and temples in Mexico. But the creepiest part was when they discovered that some of the tunnels inside the maze were entirely immersed in water. And while we can't be sure exactly why the Mayans created a labyrinth with water elements capable of drowning you, there is one theory. Apparently ancient Mayans held a belief that when you died, you had to follow a dog with night vision through a treacherous water filled journey, facing dangerous challenges before your soul could finally be put to rest. So either this terrifying water filled maze was some kind of homage to this belief, or some have even theorized it was created to practice these treacherous challenges prior to their deaths. Either way, I will not be entering no matter what. <laughs> Coming in at number 7 is Joseph Henry Loveless. Back in the 19th century, there was a terrifying criminal running rampant in Idaho. His name was Joseph Henry Loveless, and he became notorious for his connections with bootlegging and counterfeit. But each time he was caught, he always managed to escape. Fast forward a few years, and Loveless got married. But it didn't take her long to figure out that he was, well, just about the worst guy on the planet. His new bride ended up filing for divorce, something that was outrageously uncommon back then, so you know it had to have been bad. Not long after his divorce from his first wife, he met Agnes, and the pair married quickly. But then in 1916, her remains were found hacked into pieces with an axe near where the couple had been living. Loveless, of course, became a prime suspect for the crime, and in an attempt to flee, ended up being captured and arrested by the local police. But as he always did, he managed to escape jail and was never seen again. That was until 1979, when a family exploring a cave outside of St. Anthony, Idaho, were shocked to find a burlap sack wrapped torso. Then a few years later in 1991, another explorer came across a hand and the following investigations uncovered two legs. Eventually with the help of DNA, they were able to test the uncovered body parts and connect it to the notorious Joseph Loveless. But many questions remained. Who killed him and where the heck is his head? Coming in at number 6 is Homo floresiensis. Nearly 20 years ago, scientists discovered the fossilized remains of a very small human inside a cave in Indonesia called Liang Bua Cave. Upon this strange discovery, there were a lot of different opinions going around. A group of Australian scientists were calling it a newly discovered species of human and promptly named it Homo floresiensis. But there were also tons of skeptics claiming there was no proof it was a distinct species. Tragically, the fossilized bones ended up being quite damaged by one of the paleoanthropological skeptics who was studying them to try and disprove the Australian theory of real life hobbits as they had been nicknamed. But with what we know today, we have been able to prove the naysayers wrong as it turns out the very first skeleton really was a distinct new species of human, or old species of human depending on how you look at it. The first skeleton found named LB1 is estimated to have been a 30 year old woman and stood about 3 feet tall. And since that first discovery, many more of her kind have been found. Apparently they lived about 100,000 to 60,000 years ago and through extensive DNA testing, scientists have been able to confirm once and for all there is no connection to modern day little people as this had been a common defense used by skeptics. But what they don't know is just how many of these humans walked the earth and what it was that made them go extinct all those years ago. Next up at number 5 are giant bones. 
as if giant lemur bones weren't enough, inside the Pantheon de Dong cave, archaeologists uncovered even more impossibly giant and terrifying bones. Located in southern China, the bones of over 40 different species of mammal were discovered. Among them were the bones of ancient rhinos, elephant like stegodons, and even a Bigfoot like gigantopithecus. But the weirdest part wasn't the new species or even the large size of their remains. It was, in fact, that the cave was 1,600 feet above sea level with nothing but a sheer rock face leading to its entrance. So the question was, how the heck did these creatures get up there? Even weirder was that many showed signs of human manipulation or interference, like burning or cutting, which seemed to suggest that maybe humans had placed the animals up there. But that only brings up more questions. How did the humans get up there with the giant animals to begin with? We may never know. Next up at number four are stone circles. While exploring the Brunekel Cave in 2016, National Geographic reported finding a strange single change around 100 feet from the cave's entrance, and inside there was an unexplainable series of rings seemingly constructed by about 400 stalagmites. Now, that much stalagmite apparently weighs about two tons, but even stranger was that they all appeared to be cut to the same height and were carefully arranged in the circle formation. They didn't appear to be a naturally existing formation. So far, no one has been able to confirm how they got there. Some naysayers chalk it up to a weird coincidence or due to hibernating bears, but most believe that some purposefully moved them to where they are. Plus, there are traces that fire had been lit and burned along the circle, and that bones had also been burnt there at some point. So the question is, who did this? Well, it's clear that it predates Homo sapiens, and it's been radiocarbon dated to about 176,000 years ago, which would point us to Neanderthal times. So there is some speculation they could have done this. But of course, with any good mystery, there is also a conspiracy that aliens left the strange rings in the cave, but at this point, we don't really know what's true. Coming in at number three is skull cups. Despite what history would have us believe, England has quite a dark and twisted history with many skeletons in its closet. In fact, long before cheddar was famous for its delicious cheese, the people of cheddar were up to some less than proper activity, specifically the butchering and eating of other humans. Deep in the caverns of Goff's cave, archaeologists have come across many human remains dating back roughly 15,000 years. But the weirdest find were the skulls that appeared to be carefully carved into crockery, seemingly for the purpose of serving wine and tea. The other theory is that the skulls were part of some kind of ritual, but either way, it seems after they killed and ate the victims, they would remove their skulls and fashion them into cups for their tea. And it doesn't get much creepier than making dishes out of a human body, in my opinion. <laughs> Coming in at number two is a human sacrifice. The Akhtun Tunachil Muknal, or the Cave of the Crystal Sepulchre in Belize, has yielded many Mayan artifacts over the years. But the most infamous was the discovery that the cave was once upon a time a site for ritual human sacrifice. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe the most terrifying thing I could think of finding in a cave would be the skeletons of sacrificed people from thousands of years ago. I mean, doesn't that just sound like every movie where some unsuspecting hiker gets possessed? Well, when researchers walked in, they happened upon skeletons laying among ceremonial artifacts and laid on top of their own altars, clearly killed at the hands of a human. The crazy part was the wide age range of sacrifices. There were skeletons of all ages from 1 to 40. But the most shocking was that of what appeared to be a 17 year old boy. The skeleton was found with an utterly smashed vertebrae, and they hypothesized that he died in excruciating slow and painful death. Today, calcium crystals have covered his bones completely, making him appear like some gruesome snow monster. And you can bet I will never be checking this one out for myself. And last up today in our number one spot are mini coffins. One June afternoon back in 1836, a group of boys were exploring the Arthur's Seat in Scotland, a volcanic mountain found in Edinburgh. While on their trek, they stumbled across a little cave and decided to check out what was inside. The first clue that they should have maybe left it alone was that the entrance to said cave had been blocked off with a few pieces of slate. But still, the boys managed to get past and make their way in. Once they were able to peek their heads through, they were shocked to find seven 
17 miniature coffins, complete with terrifying little figurines dressed neatly in little handmade clothes and nestled inside, posed to look like they were dead people. I mean, that could not be a good sign. Of course, once local newspapers got a hold of it, townspeople were scared it was witchcraft, black magic, or some kind of occult magic, which frankly I can't blame them for. The current theory, however, is much darker. Some believe that the 17 coffins were made and buried to represent the 17 victims of the notorious body snatchers William Burke and William Eyre, and were likely there to give the families of the lost victims some closure. But it is just a theory after all, we still have no clue who made them or any clue as to the real reason why they're inside the cave to begin with, and it's highly unlikely we will ever know the truth. Thank you.